Ruth, IFPRI has launched a couple new reports on the gender subject. For example, you have a new technical guide for researchers from the Gender Agriculture and Assets Project. It gives practical lessons on how to collect data and how to design and monitor projects to address the gender asset gap. What is the gender asset gap and why is it important for addressing poverty? As it sounds, it's the gap between the assets that, that men and women in the household have. When we are defining assets, though, we're including certainly major things like land, but also uh, less tangible uh, assets like um, human and social capital, including in human capital, the nutrition and the social capital, the, the networks that people have. And why it's important for development is that many projects and programs explicitly or implicitly require assets in order to participate. So if you have a dairy project, for example, you have to have dairy animals and some way of getting fodder to them. But if women don't have the animals, then they're often excluded from the project. Or um, if you have a value chain project, you have to get your um, produce to, to market and you don't have transport, then you might be excluded. Also, we, we find more and more that assets are really important for lasting development. So for long-term uh, improvement in lives. Okay, technically speaking, the asset gap is an indicator for inequality. So in a way, it is only a symptom, you could say. So what then is the most important concrete cause for inequality? And why would it be worth focusing on tackling especially this one? So you're right that uh, it's partly driven by, by social norms about what assets are appropriate for men and women to have. Um, for example, land, is very often considered to be belong to the to the male lineage, and women are excluded by by virtue of that. Um, so there are these norms that are are driving it, but also um, assets are kind of a tangible way to look at both. And, and first of all, many programs are actually transferring assets in some way or building assets in some way either by um, giving, providing goats or animals or uh, seed and things like that, and you have to look at who you're giving it to, or they are um, helping to uh, build up um, human capital, education. And so we, we just want to draw attention to the importance of looking at whose assets are being built through the program and who's being excluded through that because it's, it's a little bit more tangible than, than addressing social norms. Renowned economists like Bill Easterly or Paul Collier now with his book uh, Exodus, for example, claim that poverty is essentially caused by dysfunctional institutions. If we consider that gender is essentially a socially constructed institution, this would mean that gender equality is fundamentally more important than many other aspects in development cooperation. Would you say that your data supports this extended hypothesis? I don't know that I'd want to say it's more important than any other development intervention, but I think there is a lot of data to support the fundamental importance of improving women's assets in particular, because we have data that shows that uh, that contributes to improved agricultural productivity, but also that assets under women's control increases their status and that assets under their control tend to be used more for basic household needs and uh, for improving the welfare of the next generation. So for long-term poverty reduction, and especially for breaking the intergenerational transmission of poverty, um, gender equality is very important. So you would have to say that 
changing social institutions is more important, not just gender equality, maybe? I think changing social institutions is very important. I think a lot of programs don't address that either because very often people say, well, that's culture and we shouldn't be interfering with culture. And that's not quite right because if you're introducing trade, you're automatically messing with culture. You know, any, any intervention will change culture. But also, when you're talking about changing institutions, people have often asked for social engineering solutions. And the, the important point is that changing institutions is not an engineering, that's the wrong analogy. There are things that will change institutions, but it's an organic process. It's not something you flip a switch or you do put this in and you get this change at the end. So you, it's a matter of, of really understanding them and looking at how they change, um, you know, from within. Basically, you could say you don't want to say that there is social engineering but if you, if you don't change your culture, other cultures will change and are more competitive than yours. So you better consider catching up with them. I think even within any culture, there are values that, that say, you know, the welfare of children are, is important, uh, for example. And many cultures actually say women are valued. It's just they're not seen as equal with men. And what we're talking about is um, creating space for women to have their own voice in terms of, of what they're wanting in this also. Why do you think that gender is a subject that is particularly important for projects in rural development and in the value chains along that line? In rural areas, you really have a, a very clear um, division of labor. Uh, gender division of labor. And so it's important to understand the role of both men and women. Very often, uh, projects have come in assuming the, the man is the farmer. And that's not always the case. Women do play a very important role in agriculture. And that's a growing role because in many places, men are either migrating or are shifting into non-farm occupations. Women are being left with a greater role in agriculture but the systems that support agriculture haven't recognized that. So extension systems, for example, have not addressed women's needs along with men. The, many of the agricultural technologies are not uh, designed taking into account women's needs and the constraints they may face. And the other important thing is that the, the uh, agriculture nutrition link is, really depends on women also because they are both the producers and, and the ones who uh, deal with converting that agriculture into food for their families. In agriculture, there's a lot of talking about technology and uh, we've also spoken about culture already. Now, I think when it comes to gender roles, there's a lot of need to talk about behavior change and maybe motivation-based approaches. In other words, how do you actually do it? How do you, how do you actually find a way or a proper methodology to, to change behaviors that are conducive to better productivity? I think one of the first behaviors to change is often in the development projects themselves. And there, what we've been able to do sometimes is show how addressing the needs of women will get, uh, or addressing gender issues will get to better uh, program outcomes. For example, we have a, a uh, we worked with a dairy project that was transferring cows to the head of household, i.e. to a man and training him, but the women were actually doing the care for the, for the, for the uh, cows, so that didn't work. And by changing the structure of the project, they got better outcomes. But uh, also changing the incentives of project managers. Very often projects are judged in terms of increases in income. Well, if that's all you're judging on, 
then you're going to go to the men and the progressive farmers and, uh, you know, because that's where you're going to show the biggest income gain. So building in incentives for projects to address uh, gender issues is important. Um, for example, the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index has been uh, used by USAID to say that, you know, your projects are going to also have to need, have to pay attention to how uh, uh, women are benefiting and, you know, the extent to which they are getting better uh, control, input in decision making, control over assets, control over income. Are they members of groups? And are they getting are they getting too much of a time burden? Then, then once you have that, there are ways for behavior change within projects. In terms of even um, one example was a project in Burkina Faso that was a, a collective garden. Sometimes it's really threatening to ask for land rights for individual women. So they set aside a collective garden for the whole uh, community women. When men saw that women were actually very productive with that land and that it was benefiting their household, that helped to change norms in um, about whether it's okay for women to own land. Being able to bring in more of these factors in how we define success helps. But we're still quite a stretch to calling it a, a methodology that we have sort of a unified approach or idea how to actually come away from ad hoc systems on how to build in this factor and that factor, that we have a more of a methodology how to approach that. Is that right? We're not, we're not there yet, are we? Um, well, one of the first principles about gender is that it is site specific. So you can't bring in uh, something that worked in Burkina Faso and, you know, import it wholesale into Bangladesh. You will always have to contextualize. Uh, but there are tools that we have for how to identify what are the important um, factors to consider in contextualizing it. We've developed a checklist, for example, of of factors to look at for how gender might affect the outcome of your program. We've developed uh, tools for doing uh, both qualitative data collection and surveys, how to use do baseline surveys that will help you give a diagnostic of um, your area and then what are the key areas of constraint. So we have a number of tools that you can use for that uh, contextualizing. We're here with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development and there is the annual General Assembly coming up and it's all under the theme of gender and food systems this time. What would be your message to the donors in terms of how you think they could better utilize your research? Uh, how could they better influence maybe government policy making how how does your what is maybe a good uh, counterintuitive finding to to take forward to them and say listen here this is what you need to do for a long time people had the notion of a family as just what a household as just one unit and then there was this bargaining model that said there's men and women separately our research has really highlighted the importance of recognizing uh, both the separate um, assets and livelihood strategies of men and women and the jointness within households. And we think that this looking at the extent to which uh, you can strengthen this jointness can even create collective action within the household and within communities to as an entry point rather than, than saying that it's men or women that you're working with. I think we have made a lot of progress in being able to measure uh, gender issues and to the extent that they can bring that in both as a diagnostic and as an indicator of success, 
that will um, really help to strengthen uh, these activities on the ground. Um, I have to give a lot of credit to donors who have championed gender issues. We sometimes talk about things being donor driven as though that's a bad thing. But I think in this case, donors have picked up, donors who champion gender issues have picked up on the considerable research about that shows how important this is for really long-term food security and for long-term poverty reduction and are creating space for women to be involved as co-investors even in, uh, in rural development and in uh, producing food for their, their families, their communities, and even for the world. Thank you. Well, thank you.